Hello friends, hope all of you are doing well. In today's session, we are going to discuss the part 2 of the poem Prothalmion, which will comprise the remaining 5 stanzas, the last 5 stanzas of the poem. The first 5 stanzas of the poem I have already discussed and uploaded a couple of days back. So I highly recommend those of you who have not watched the first part and have came here to watch the second part to go ahead and watch the first part so that you can have some clarity regarding the second part. The link for the first part you will find in the i button above the video and also in the description of the playlists given. So the sixth stanza starts with the lines Ye gentle birds, the world's fair ornament and heaven's glory, whom this happy hour doth lead unto your lover's blissful power. In the first part, we have witnessed that how the poet Edmund Spencer described the beauty of the swans and he was so expressive while expressing the beauty of the swans that he even went on to describe that even the nymphs were enchanted by the swans that they started singing in the grace and in the honor of the swans. So continuing his statement, he moves forward to claim that the swans, here the birds in the first line represent the two swans, okay? that the swans are the world's fair ornament and they represent heaven's glory. All right, whom this happy hour doth lead unto your lover's blissful power. So we have already discussed the word power. Power means a pleasant shady place under trees or climbing plants in a garden or tree. So you can say that in his own statement, the poet is trying to say, you swans who are the world's beautiful decoration and the glory of the skies. You are being led to your lovers and I wish you joy and happiness in your marriage. So in the fourth line of the sixth stanza, we see how the poet is trying to express and bless the swans with joy. Joy may you have and gentle hearts content of your love's compliment. So here the poet Edmund Spencer is trying to bless the two swans with joy and is also praying that their hearts should be contented and it should be in the right place. And obviously their love should complement their partners. All right. So let's move on and let fair Venus, that is the queen of love. Now we have seen this Venus already in the poem. So Venus in Greek mythology represents the queen of love with a heart quelling sun upon you smile. Now this heart quelling sun is none other than Cupid. We are all familiar with Cupid and how Cupid looks like and he happens to be the god of love in Greek mythology and also the son of Venus. So he is also praying that both Venus and Cupid should bless the two swans whose smile they say hath virtue to remove all love's dislike and friendship faulty guile. So here you see that they are now you know appreciating the smile the swans have and they are saying that the smile that they possess is very pure in nature and it has the virtue to remove all the dislikes in a person's life. All right. And what does the word guile means? Guile means sly or cunning intelligence. Okay. Forever to assoil. Assoil means acquit or pardon. Now let's move on. Uh, let endless peace your steadfast hearts accord. Now accord. What is the meaning of accord? Accord means give or grant someone power, status or recognition. Now the poet here is saying that their hearts should have endless peace. Okay. It should be blessed and graced with endless peace peace and blessed plenty weight upon your board and let your bed with pleasures chased abound. Now very important line here. These three lines he is trying to first of all bless them is like praying that uh, they should have endless peace in their life and also a lot waiting in their future of course and their bed of course their life that means their life should be full of pleasures it should be full of chastity. Chaste means what? Chaste means you know, it's abstaining from extramarital or from sexual intercourse. Basically, chastity means purity, okay? So not being involved in a sexual intercourse before marriage, that is called chastity. That means it's pure, basically. Abound means exist in large numbers or amounts. So he is praying that their life should be filled with pleasures, chastity, and abound, okay? Lot of happiness. That fruitful issue may to you afford which may your force confound. Confound means cause surprise or confusion in someone. Basically, the, their life should be so much blessed with happiness, pleasures, chastity, and it should be in so much abundance that even their force will be caught by surprise that how can someone be so happy? And make your joys rebound. Rebound means contribute greatly to a person's credit or honor. So your 
he is also hoping that their joys that they have there in their life should be you know rebounded okay contribute to someone else life as well upon your bridal day which is not long so this is again the second last line of the stanza which is repeated in most of the poems you will see in a different fashion of course so he is also giving the hint that the bridal day the marriage day is not far beyond and at the end of the stanza he ends the stanza in the same fashion sweet themes run softly till i end my song he is arching the Thames River, which also happens to be the longest river of England, to run softly because he is singing in the honor of the two swans. Also, a key note here, guys: the two swans basically represents the two characters here, Catherine and Elizabeth, as I have mentioned in the beginning of the poem, the part one video. So you don't be confused that we hear the poet is basically, you know, discussing and singing the in the honor of the marriage of the two daughters. That is. Uh, Catherine and Elizabeth, and here all of a sudden he has made made a switch to the swans. The swans basically represent the two girls. All right. So the seventh stanza starts with "So ended she, and all the rest around to her redoubled that her undersong, which said their bridal day should not be long, and gentle echo from neighbour ground their accents did resound. So far those joyous birds did pass along adown the lea." that to them murmured low so lee uh, again i have explained it what is the meaning of lee here uh, so let us understand what this few lines explains here so basically that was the end of the nymph song so the nymph was singing if in case if you remember the nymphs were singing in the honor of the two swans so the the first line obviously represents that the nymph has ended her song and everyone repeated her all right whatever the nymph was singing the everyone around her was repeating her words announcing that the swans wedding day wasn't far off and the ground echoed with the line with this line which then echoed throughout the meadow thus the joyous swans went down the river lee okay so basically lee means here the river all right because i've also this also explained it in a detailed fashion in the part 1 video in case if you want to see it you can obviously see as he would speak and that he lacked a tongue yet did by signs his glad affections show making his stream run low and all the fowl which in his flood did dwell so what are the meaning of this lines let us understand this so it's it's waters murmured as they passed okay the swans were on the water and the water were murmuring as they passed almost as they as though the river would speak to them if they were able able to speak so basically in this lines the poet edmund spencer is trying to represent the water in which the swans were swimming but he did make his affection clear by slowing down his current so even the water the river lee in which the swans were uh, you know uh, swimming it was also expressing his gratitude and is also expressing in terms of in terms of honoring the two swans can flock about this twine that did excel now here the word twine means two basically it's a archaic term for two and the poet edmund spencer is representing the two swans with the word twine and with the word flock he is trying to explain a group of birds which are gathering around the two swans the rest so far as cynthia dot shend now the word cynthia is again a mythological figure greek mythological figure basically a greek goddess which represents a moon goddess here the lesser stars so they and ranged well did on those two attend and their best service lend so let us understand what does this few lines mean basically what is happening is is that all the birds that lived on the river began to flock around this two swans who were far more beautiful than this other birds okay just as moon is far more beautiful than the stars around it so the moon that is being represented here is cynthia the moon goddess who is far more beautiful than the stars around it so the poet edmund spencer is comparing the swans with the beauty of the moon in this way the, they arranged themselves around the swans and waited on them and lent them their best service for their wedding day which was not far away 
all right and again the final two lines of this stanza again suggest the same thing against their wedding day which was not long the poet giving the hint that the wedding day is not far be uh, not far and it's quite uh, it's coming soon and again in the final line of the stanza he is requesting his uh, requesting the thames river to run softly till he ends his song the eighth stanza starts with the lines at length they all to marry london came to marry london my most kindly nurse that to me gave this life's first native source though from another place i take my name and house of ancient fame so here after a while what happens is they all come to london which was where the poet was born and raised though he was named after a different place and comes from a well and old well known family all right so these are the lines uh, this lines means that basically what is happening here is that a poet edmund spencer and along with all the swans and all whatever his uh, fantasy world is going around they come back to london and here is you know re reminding himself about his origins okay let's move on there when they came whereas those bricky towers the which on thames broad aged back to right where now the studious lawyers have their bowers there while on warm the templars night to bide so what does this line means let us understand so they came to a place where there were brick towers on the banks of the thames all right so again the narrative of the entire poem is built around the river thames which is happens to be the longest river of london so here what is happening uh, which serves now so that entire building which they are talk, the poet is talking about it serves now as the housing for law students all right the lawyers though in the past they were had had quarters of the knights templar so we are very uh, familiar with this uh, word the knights templar uh, basically some missionary force uh, and this knight templars were very popular in the middle ages until that order crumbled due to pride so that is a big, in very interesting uh, representation of history till uh, you can see this line here till they decayed through pride all right so the templar knights who is to be the uh, you know a very popular uh, group or a community of knights who happens to represent the english in the medieval ages uh, their their entire legacy ended because of the pride because uh, when the templars started on their mission it was very noble profession and they were set out to save the people or uh, against the atrocities of different religions but eventually it turned out to be something very brutal all right we'll not go to the past uh, let's see what happens next here so next where unto their sands a stands a stately place where oft i gain gifts and goodly grace of that great lord which therein want to dwell who's want to well now feels my friendless case but ah here fits not well old woes but joys to tell so what does this lines means let us understand it as a, in a summarized way so what happens next to this big towers there is a place where the poet often received favors from an important poem important man who lives there whose protection the poet is missing and he sorely misses now though it is uh, it is inappropriate to meditate on such grievances here and the poet should limit himself to taking to talking about the joys of the wedding day which is not far away so here we can see that again the again the narrative of the entire poem is drifted and it shifted to the poet's own personal life uh, which was the beginning of the entire poem you can see that in the beginning of the poem itself the poet was talking about his life and how there was a dilemma in his life there was a confusion and there was a sadness in his life again he was like kind of drifted away back again he came back to his senses thinking that it is not wise to think about anything else other than the wedding and he should focus on the wedding as he said on the final la second last line of this eighth stanza against the bridal day which is not long and again in this final stanza the last stanza ends with the same line sweet thames run softly till i end my song moving on to the ninth stanza yet that in now dot lodge a noble peer great england's glory and the world's wide wonder so this lines the first two lines of the ninth stanza means 
that in that place there now lives an aristocrat who brings honor to england and whom the rest of the world admires so the place where the poet is describing now there lives a aristocrat who is very popular and who brings honor to england and whom the whole world knows whose dreadful name late through all spain did thunder and hercules two pillars standing near did make to quake quake and fear so what is happening here is that on a recent mission he terrorized who terrorized the aristocrat who brings honor to england he terrorized the spanish and made cliffs on either side of the straits of gibraltar shake with fear all right so here we are talking about the aristocrat who is living in the building who is bringing honor to england so quite a drift from the actual narrative of the poem here but let's move on and see uh fair branch of fair branch of honor flower of chivalry that finest that fillest england with thy triumphs fame joy have thou of thy noble victory and endless happiness of thine own name so let us understand what this line means here so here actually the man of honor exceptional knight the news of your triumphs travels across england i hope uh, that means here that means the poet is hoping that he takes joy in his victory and he remains happy forever since his name promises that it will bring him happiness all right that promise at the same that through the prowess and victorious arms thy country may be freed from foreign harms and great eliza's glorious name may ring so eliza here the word eliza means queen elizabeth we all know that the great britain is being administered by a queen by the queen that's queen elizabeth during those ages uh, and even today when the administration of england or the great britain has drastically changed they do most of their work under the name of the queen all right so what is happening is here here is that the poet edmund spencer is trying to say that the, with the prowess and the victorious battles that the knights have fought uh, it has kept the country freed uh, from the any of the foreign harms and basically it has brought glory in the name of queen elizabeth through all the world filled with thy wide alarms which some brave muse may sing to ages following so what is happening here is that the all the bravery that is being displayed in the battles by the knights which is bringing bringing glory in the name of queen elizabeth and england and great britain will be sung by the poets in their you know poems they will be singing in the glory of this popular knights in the brave knights all right so quite a shift from the main narrative of the poem here also the poet here brings out a different aspect of britain basically he is trying to say that the knights were fighting for their country for their motherland uh, but again we know that england is quite popular for their colonial uh, regime throughout the ages and it's it's like quite a hypocrisy here but we'll not go to that part we'll just understand what's the basic understanding and what's the narrative or the the poet is trying to build here so eventually he ends the stanza with the final two lines upon the bridal day which is not long sweet themes run softly till i end my song so coming to the final stanza of the poem prothalmian from those high towers this no, noble lord issuing like radiant hesper when is golden hair now hesper radiant hesper means evening star hesperus again a greek mythological figure we know that various elements of greek mythology has been used in this poem and basically most of the poems of edmund spencer so it's nothing very surprising just you need to remember that radiant hesper here means evening star hesperus in the ocean billows he hath bathed fair descended to the rivers opening open viewing all right let us understand so what does this lines four lines means of the final stanza from the tall battlements of the house the same aristocrat whom i described in the previous uh, whom the poet described in the previous stanza came out like the evening star hesperus now what is happening here is that the poet edmund spencer is describing the aristocrat in that building who is bringing honor in the name of the country Uh, with the evening star hesperus who bathes his blond hair in the ocean all day and then rises ab- above the horizon at night so quite a explanation uh, 
again uh, again it's uh, the final stanza is also a shift from the main narrative of the poem which actually the core essence of the poem is actually celebrating the marriage the marriage of the twin daughters elizabeth and catherine with the expressing vibe expressing them as swans uh, here again is a shift but again we can have to understand that the poet is very much proud of his motherland and which can be easily seen in the final few stanzas so let's move on with a great train and swing above the rest where goodly to be seen two gentle knights of lovely face and feature beseeming well the power of any queen with gifts of wit and ornaments of nature now he is bringing the entire thing into sense like how he is trying to connect it's in a very beautiful way let us understand the aristocrat came down to the river with many people following him among the crowd two handsome knights stood out who would have been a fitting match for any queen indeed they were so intelligent and well made that they seemed like jew's son all right so what is happening is that the aristocrat that the poet was talking about uh, when he came out and he was accompanied by two gentle knights of lovely face and feature as we can see in this lines and the remaining lines has been said in the honor of this two knights beseeming well the power of any queen okay so this knights were able to, were capable of, capable of impressing any queen with gifts of wit and ornaments of nature so they were witful people and also they were gifted uh, with grace fit for so goodly stature that like the twins of jaff they seemed in sight now here it's a very game changing line here twins of jaff so we have already seen the first part of the poem that jaff here basically represents jews okay and twins of jaff means jews sons castor and pollock who in greek mythology become stars part of the constellation gemini so this is a basic information that i think you should know Uh, so with the word twins of jaff he is trying to say the poet is trying to say that the twin sons of the twin sons of the jews so jews happens to be the god of all gods and god of lightning here so he is comparing the two knights with the jews sons castor and pollock all right okay let's move on uh, which deck the baldric of the heavens bright they two forth pacing to the river side received those two fair birds their loves delight now this are very interesting lines uh, let us understand this what is happening here is that two knights went down to the river to meet the two swans whom they loved dearly all right so that's what being happening here and that the two swans who have been coming down the river lee finally met the knights uh, what happened next let's see which at the appointed tide each one did make his bride now here is the main uh, plot revelation you can say here the two knights that the finally in the final stanza the poet is describing about is about to get married with the swans now don't uh, get it wrong the two swans with the two swans the poet is trying to represent the two girls all right catherine and elizabeth so the two knights will now get married to those two girls against their bridal day which is not long sweet themes run softly till i and my song so at the scheduled time they will get married and that wedding day is not far away so here again the poet ends the poem with the same line please be quiet river thames until i finish my poem so poem or his song basically this entire poem is kind of a ode or a song uh, sung in the grace uh, in the honor of the wedding of the two daughters uh, elizabeth and catherine with the two knights So this is the video guys I hope you have found some clarity regarding this poem Prothalamian by Edmund Spencer which is basically a 10 stanza poem of 180 lines I have divided this entire poem into two parts part 1 I have already uploaded a couple of days back and I highly recommend that you all of you go ahead and watch that video in case if you have not watched it and then come and watch this video as well I understand also understand that the final few stanzas were a little bit out of the track and a little bit complex compared to the first five stanzas but i've tried my best to explain you in the simplest way i can even though if you have any other doubts regarding this poem or the final five stanzas you are free to let me know you can comment in the comment section i'll definitely try to address it in the next video or come up with a you know q and a session if you want till then god bless you and thank you all